Alongside glorious oral traditions, the manuscripts represent an exciting new resource, which the government is doing its best to protect. But Mali is one of Africa's poorest countries, with many pressing issues. Just 50 years old, the modern state of Mali is still concerned with its own internal security. This is a monument to a 1996 peace deal with the Tuareg. The tribesmen have been rebelling sporadically against the government ever since the modern state of Mali was created in 1960. The last president, Alpha Kanari, worked hard to heal divisions. But many Tuareg want greater autonomy, even their own homeland. It's been a rocky road to a tentative peace. Timbuktu has weathered the many changes forced upon it, but the pace of change is accelerating. Western influences are easy to spot, especially among Timbuktu's youth. Visitors will bring much needed prosperity, but all the hazards of a tourist industry too. The process of reinvention is making its mark on the townscape. A state-of-the-art new home for the Ahmed Baba Institute is nearing completion next to the Sankori Mosque. It's a radical juxtaposition of new and old. Many here hope that by exploiting the legacy of the manuscripts, they can not only regain their status as an international centre of culture, but secure an economically viable future. The manuscript which you have seen can become a real industry. They can be like a mine, like a gold mine. This cultural renaissance will rediscover our manuscripts. They will be broadcast and the whole world will be more knowledgeable. And Timbuktu will be like a lighthouse, lighting up all of Africa. If you come back in 10 years' time, you might find that people wanting to visit the moon will decide to come to Tombuktu instead. Anything's possible. The last time I was in Timbuktu, my visit was just a fleeting one. But having spent two weeks in the town, I think what surprised me most is the sheer scale, the sophistication, and the antiquity of the civilization that existed here. What I've discovered is that in Timbuktu, history isn't measured in centuries. It's measured in millennia. Timbuktu teaches us that history is a game of chance, that the ambitions of powerful men affect ordinary folk and events thousands of miles away can change fortunes, that wealth and cultural aspirations are intricately linked, but most of all why reading matters, then and now. Reading represents a meeting with myself and then with others. It's a form of dialogue through time and space. For me, reading is an inexhaustible source of knowledge. Reading is the only way to get access to the universal knowledge. And we cannot be outside of this universal knowledge. The first leg of my journey home is a relatively short one to Mali's capital, at least in terms of miles and minutes. Here in Bamako, almost a thousand kilometers upstream from Timbuktu, it already feels like a different world. Timbuktu, as it once was, is gone, but the manuscripts survive, and with them a sense of what was once a magnificent achievement. Africa's recent and troubled history can't be rewritten, but her history is beginning to be, and with it, perhaps, a vision of her future. For centuries, camel caravans have crisscrossed the Sahara Desert, making the grueling trek to the region's salt mines. But now what has served as a rite of passage for the nomadic culture is under serious threat. A recent drought is taking a serious toll on the camels and more efficient means of transport are being sought. The BBC's Africa correspondent Andrew Harding has gone to the city of Timbuktu 
where they're reluctantly adapting to the changes. It's a grueling journey at the best of times. Camels bringing giant blocks of salt from an ancient mine deep in the Sahara Desert. <coughs> Groaning like some creature out of Star Wars is Lakmar, a veteran salt hauler. <coughs> But the 1400 kilometer round trip is getting harder for him every year. These salt slabs have not changed in centuries, but the weather has. It's getting more difficult because the rains aren't coming and the camels get tired and thirsty and can't continue. But these can. The modern world is finally catching up with the salt trade and transforming it. By camel, the round trip to the salt mines used to take about 45 days, but in a truck like this, they can do it in about a week. And in the space of a few short years, the trucks have taken over more than half the salt business. The salt market in Timbuktu. From here, these blocks are shipped all over West Africa. But salt trader Halis al Hassani says it's not the same by truck. The camel caravans were a vital part of the local nomadic Tuareg culture. We are very upset about that, but we have not really choice because every year the drought is coming more difficult. And myself, when I see the truck take the salt, I'm very upset and I think life completely changed for us. It's terrible for, for me, it's the end of the, to, to the Tuareg culture. Loading up for another trip, these miners will spend six months digging the salt out by hand in blistering hot conditions. Thanks to the trucks, the industry is now more profitable, but Sheikh Ul Bekai says he still feels guilty about selling his camels. I don't want to use a truck, but my camels simply couldn't cope anymore. Another sign then of our changing climate and the beginning of the end for an ancient trading tradition. Andrew Harding, BBC News, Timbuktu.